All right, so we'll start the meeting. Call to order. Uh, any changes to the agenda tonight? Hearing I none. Have... How about public comment? Anyone from the public out there, Eric? We do have public in the room and online. Yep. So Anyone typically we go. Public want to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda? I was going to say typically we we go to public in the room first um, for any comments. So if you want to offer anything. Okay, no comments in the room. It looks like our member online has their hand raised to talk. So uh, if you could uh, announce yourself and... Hi. Uh, Hi. You Are you sure your name? Yes. My name is Sarah. Um, and I apologize that it's loud. I'm actually walking over there right now. Um, I have never attended one of these. So I apologize for not knowing the, the format. Um, I was wondering if we could discuss the intersection of Dion and Allen Street. Okay, that wouldn't be here. That would not be there. Okay. No. That would be, okay. uh, well, there, there was a meeting. Did you go to the, the meeting on LaFountain Street? Um, what was it, Christine? Help me with it. The scoping study? Okay. Oh, I apologize. I thought that's what this was. No, this is planning commission. Okay. But you're welcome to I'm... stay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I might be looking at the wrong agenda then. Um, okay. Sarah, you were probably thinking of that. We had that on the city council meeting on Monday night. So the meeting happened. It will be coming back to city council at a future meeting. And you are also okay. welcome to come into the, any upcoming city council meeting uh, during that public comment. So we'll be meeting okay. again um, May 20th at 6 p.m. at City Hall or via Zoom. Um, will a link go out in front porch form about that? Yeah, it will. And um, also, if you would like, um, you could email me directly as well. Yeah, would you be able to? I think I'm. I might head home then. I think I'm going to turn around. But um, would you be able to share your email address in the chat? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry to take up your time, guys. No problem. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for stopping in. Maybe sometime you'll join us for a whole meeting. They're so exciting. <laughs> I'm new. I'm new to the area, so I probably will. Thank okay. you, guys. Have a good Thanks, night. Sarah. Um, quickly, Eric, I can only message hosts and panelists. Would you be able oh. to put my email in the, for everyone? Yes. It's just Klot at Winooski VT. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Any other people in the public? Uh, there is no, nobody else online and no one else in the room. Okay. All right. So then we'll move to approval of the previous minute meeting minutes and I see only Sarah and I are here. Do Tommy, Abby, and Joe wish to abstain, or would you like to go ahead and vote on this? I'd like to abstain. Me too. All right, so we'll, we'll just put the, the approval of minutes off till the next meeting then, okay? Yep, that's fine. We can table those. Sure. All right. So then we go into continued discussion on unifying land use and development regulations amendments related to statutory changes. Eric. Yes, thank you very much. Up. So what I included with the agenda tonight is the statutory report uh, in our lead up to the public hearing uh, at our last meeting on um, whatever that was. April 25th, we uh, the Planning Commission set a public hearing for May 23rd to take public comments on the draft amendments to the Unified Land Use and Development Regulations. Specifically, uh, as, as with all public hearings, that doesn't require you to take any action. You can also make changes uh, at that hearing or after the hearing, um, or you can forward amendments on to City Council for their consideration. So I wanted to put this, or Mike and I talked, and we decided to bring this forward to you all so that you could at least see the full of amendment package uh, I know uh, some of you were not at the last meeting, so you did not get a chance to see some of the changes. So uh, what I wanted to do is just walk through the amendments, um, not necessarily get into any serious discussion about them tonight, because we can do that at the public hearing, but just to bring everybody up to speed on where we are with the amendments and, um, and what's included. Uh, also, I have a couple of changes 
from our last meeting that I'll highlight. This is just for reference, the, the information you had in the agenda is what was advertised for the public hearing as well. So this is what the, the public has available to them for that hearing. So I'm gonna share my screen. And Eric, did you did you just say that we're not going to be like making subst substantial changes tonight? I think, Abby, I think we can note those changes, but it would probably be best if we talk about those at the hearing to actually formalize the changes so that they're uh, so that they'll be done in the context of the hearing, and so that the public is aware of of what what is being changed. Since this is what was advertised for that hearing, but but uh, let me chime in because we did want to allow the folks who weren't here at the last meeting a chance to give input so if there is something that sticks out correct feel free to, to talk about it yes absolutely that's yes thank you mike it's not to yeah. suggest that we should not talk about the amendments but just to uh if we're going to be making substantive changes we should probably do that in the context of the hearing or at the hearing so that um what is advertised well, we wouldn't be able to make any of the changes formal until we did the hearing anyway. So because of because this was already advertised for the hearing. So, um, but very good question. So the first couple of pages of the application of the packet are just the uh, report, the statutory report outlining consistency with um, the uh, state's state's requirements. So I'm just going to kind of cruise through things. Uh, please stop me if you if you need to discuss anything or want to discuss anything. So the first section, Article Two, we have a couple changes. Nothing new in the uh, under under the applicability in two point three. That remains the same as it's been under Item E. And I'll apologize for the scrolling under the land use table. From the previous version to this version, we did make some updates to the multi-unit development or multi-unit dwellings, the five plus units. So it was previously in the last version at our April 25th meeting, it was noted as permitted in the residential C. Uh, I think there was some confusion about why we were calling that permitted. Uh, mostly it was in relation to the fact that we are allowing it. We are allowing five or more units as part of a planned unit development with specific conditions. So we are not allowing that as a use just in general. So now there is this note that says C section 5.14, which is our reference to the priority housing uh, requirements that we've established already that are already included. So that that change has been made so that to indicate that multi-unit dwellings are not permitted in the um, in the the re, uh, in any of the residential districts unless the standards of the priority housing are met which as for reference, priority housing is um, dwellings that are affordable or three three or more bedrooms or both. And just to clarify, not multi-unit dwellings because we allow three and four, but five plus multi-unit dwellings. Correct. <laughs> that's correct. Okay. Yep. Eric, yes. I'm, that's, I'm sorry. That's... I, I messed up. I hit some button on this computer that logged me out. So where are you right now? Um, not much further than where we just were. I'm in the uh, land use table. Okay. And and were you talking about the five plus units? Yes. All right. Because yep. I'm still, as I said before, I'm still in favor of making uh, five plus units at least a conditional use in the RC zone and um, limiting how many units per building in that zone. But we can talk about it at the public hearing. Yep. Because I know uh, there's other people that disagree with that. Correct. Yeah. So nothing else on that section has changed. We did add retail sales, neighborhood commercial as a conditional use in the residential A, just for consistency with the rest of the districts, the residential districts. I believe that's the only, I think that's the only other significant or not significant, the only other change uh, to the land use table. Everything else on this section is the same as it was. All the footnotes remain the same as they were, have been. Um, when we get into the dimensional tables, the only thing that's changed here, all the dimensions in the primary or principal structure are the same as they were previously. The accessory structure we did add under the maximum height. We did add a caveat. So it always read that it was 75% of the principal or primary structure, but no less than 10 feet 
uh, with the, the footnote of the accessory, uh, accessory dwellings could go up to 20 feet. We've now added this upper limit to, to cap it at 25 feet for an accessory structure. So it's it'd be no less than 10 or no more than 25. And that was from some discussion at our last meeting. Uh, there was the, the, the point was made that we allow for 35 feet of height in our, uh, of the primary structure. So 75% of that would be, I think like 26 feet or somewhere in there is what we calculated it out to be. So, uh, or an odd ratio of numbers. So we decided to, to limit the upper end, um, as well, just in case. Yeah, it'd be 26 and a quarter feet at 75% of the maximum height in the residential districts. So this now puts an upper limit on the height of a primary, uh, of, sorry, of an accessory structure in those districts. Um, okay, moving along. Here's where I've added some additional language. I There was new language added at our last meeting in the descriptions of the districts. Uh, but to try to kind of get at some of the density component, uh, I did add some additional language that talks about the number of units that would be permitted. So in this case, um, a density of approximately five units per acre in the residential A, density of approximately eight units per acre in the residential B, and density of approximately 14 units per acre in the residential C. Just to clarify, those density limits are based solely on the number of lots that could be created based on the minimum lot size that's required. So for example, in the residential A, the minimum lot size that we're proposing is 7,500 square feet. So that divided by one acre is five and change. So rounding down to what you could create on a lot. So it does not take into account special conditions or considerations like planned unit developments where you'd be able to get potentially get more density than that. This is just what's being reflected on an as right or a by right basis for density. So, so just to throw a, a wrench in it, wouldn't it be really 10 units? If you get five lots and you can put two units per lot? Well, you could potentially put up to four units per lot. Right, but I mean, so, that, but, but in like in the RA, if you're doing three or four, isn't that a conditional use? Did I miss um, it? I well, remember that. Yes. Uh, no, sorry. It would have to go through site plan review if you're doing four units. Right. Which makes it conditional use, right? I mean, it's it's similar, but it's not it's not exclusively a conditional use where we have exactly. to have it as a permitted use per statute. Yeah. Uh, Act 47 requires that it, it remain as a con, uh, as a permitted use. But okay. we, a permitted use, not correct. conditional use. Yep. Right. Yes. But we'd still right now, our standards require that those go through site plan review, anything more than two units. And where is that written out? That is in section 6.6, .6, I believe. Is it it's part not, of the, the review that we're doing today? That is not part of this review. No, we're not proposing any changes to, to that section at this time. Okay. But it's an article six somewhere. <laughs> I don't I don't remember the exact citation off the top of my head, but yeah, site plan review and all the criteria that go with it would apply to any anything over two units. Um, and to Mike's point about the number of units per acre, is it four times five? Because you can do up to four units in a building? Well, and that's, I guess it could be. So I'm, I'm simply expressing it on a, basically on a, a on a single unit basis with these definitions we could express it differently if you want uh we would could it be more it. accurate to say buildings instead of units or, five, or five lots it's really five lots per acre yeah it is that's that's true so yeah we could that could clarify that it up to five lots per acre okay and then that would carry forward to the rb and rc yeah So I added this language, like I said, to kind of get to the, the density question that we had talked about at a previous meeting, uh, just to kind of show some gradation of these three residential districts and kind of what those categorical differences look like. So nothing else in Article 2. 
And I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit because there's nothing new proposed in Article 3 either, uh, which is our downtown district specifically. Can I ask one quick question, Eric? Sure. Um, what is the um, ceiling height, the required ceiling height, interior ceiling height in a, in a, on, on a floor? I believe our municipal code in the housing chapter requires a minimum of seven feet. Okay. Interior interior height for it to be considered livable space. So could you get in a 25 foot building, could you get three full floors? I mean, that's 18, 19, 20, 20, 22, 23, 24. It would be tight because you got space between the floors too. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean I think it doesn't allow three, it just allows two. I mean, I think it would be possible. Whether it be practical is another question. Just because, well, yeah, it would just take for a building to be put up that was not comfortable. You know what I mean? If sure, <laughs> cram in another floor of living just because we can. Yeah, I would be surprised if anybody would do that. Just because dimensions of lumber don't come in, you're, you're basically buying lumber that you'd be throwing away to to save space or buying building materials that you're throwing away just based on standard building material dimensions. But could that be balanced out if you were to rent that place for a long time, that that cost might be worth it? I'm just asking this question of, you know, do- I, I mean, I guess it's, it's possible whether or not it's practical, I think is another question. I don't know that the state would allow something like that because if it's okay. a multi-unit building, the state's gonna have to review it anyway. So okay. I don't know if the state would allow that. Okay. But technically, based on our housing regulations in our municipal code, we do allow for a ceiling height, uh, minimum ceiling height of seven feet interior. Yeah. So, um, okay. So like I said, in our article three, nothing new. Um, it's all related to the downtown core. In article four, um, no, I don't believe there's anything new here either from our last meeting. One thing I actually was, I was looking at this the other day, and this is something that I may bring forward to, to you at the public hearing related to uh, the residential and non-residential driveways. Um, we did, we are proposing to increase the number of, of for multi-unit to five, more than five residential uh, dwelling units. I'm actually... Something that I'm I've been thinking about is whether or not we should even have. So right now it's it's not showing here, but we have a um, part E of section four point two is for residential driveways. And actually, let me just look at the language. So we differentiate it between just residential of, I think I think right now it says three or fewer, and then the multi unit and non residential at what is currently existing three or more. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is really related to this, this driveway distance for multi-unit and non-residential from adjacent property boundaries that it needs to be at least 25 feet away. Um, this may create some issues just given the fact that we've got a lot of narrow lots. And if we're adding, for example, somebody comes in, if they have a a narrow lot that's very deep and they're doing a planned unit development with five units, they may have to move their driveway to a location that doesn't work or isn't even possible. So what I was thinking about is that leaving this section, part F, just for non-residential driveways. So for any type of commercial buildings, um, office buildings, things like that, they would have the minimum setback of 25 feet. And then we would just capture all of our residential driveways under one category, which allows them to be up to, I believe, five feet to the property boundary, which a lot of our properties already are and um, already have that component. So it would save from having to move a driveway into a location that otherwise would may not be feasible on a lot and therefore limit the number of units that they might be able to put even uh, to put on a lot, even if they're permitted. So, um, I'll bring you more information on that at a future meeting or at our next meeting, but that's something that um, I think it's a fairly simple change. It's just 
hard to explain without actually seeing it in writing. So flag Eric, that do you know where the 25 feet, feet number came from? I don't. I'm, my guess is that that is intended to provide some separation uh, between curb cuts for non-residential uses so that you don't have a bunch of non-residential uses that might have higher turnover and traffic right next to each other. Yeah. Good that's point. that's the only thing I can think of is that it's really intended to space out some of those driveways. The other thing is if it's uh, if it's going if it, if we have a, a a property that's proposing five or more units, it's going to go through site plan review, and that'll all be looked at from Public Works and the Development Review Board as well. So they will evaluate uh, any conditions that might be necessary for the siting of an actual driveway, yeah, or a new driveway, I should say since that's this applies to new driveways. So uh, anyway. Eric, to... I, have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, the stuff that's already part of um, our regulation, like it's already gone through the process and is part of the current language, can it be not highlighted in red and underlined? Because it's sort of confusing. If I was the public, I would think everything red and underlined was up for discussion. Well, in this case, it is. Um, so okay, so if you back up, because um, maybe I, I'm not understanding, if you back up to the section before that you kind of quickly went over and said nothing has changed. Um, uh, in Article 3, you mean? Article, yeah, 3.6. Okay. And then um, all of the required bike parking stuff is still highlighted. Yes, that's because, that so changed? yeah, so good question uh, for clarification. So we added all the bicycle parking into article four in our general parking standards. The parking standards in article three are specific to the downtown core and did not exist previously. So this is all new language to add to match what we included in article four uh, for bicycle parking. So we're proposing to require bicycle parking in the downtown core as well. Okay. So if this were to come up for discussion and any changes proposed, then we would have to go back to the other article and also make changes so that well, it's consistent. We, we could, we don't have to, but we could, the, the <clears> language, <throat> the language that's in here now under bicycle parking is exactly what's in Article four and any changes to Article four are also re re under the bicycle parking because we did have a couple minor tweaks are also reflected in in the bicycle parking under Article three. Okay, and then the table right above that that deals with uh, minimum off street vehicle parking. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry, I probably missed this discussion, but um, I know we have the one space per dwelling unit as a part of Act forty seven, and then it looks like the only other category is. Um, one space per sleeping room for lodging or bed and breakfast. So um, all of the other uses that are crossed out, what is their parking requirement or do they have no parking? Minimum? Yeah, so they would have no minimum off-street parking. We would basically, because it's in a downtown setting and because of the, sorry, I'm on the wrong table. Because it's in a downtown setting, because we have the parking garage, because we have on-street metered parking in the downtown core, it was at, at a previous discussion, it was determined that basically all these other uses are going to be high turnover anyway, or are intended to have high turnover, and we have public parking available so that, that we don't need to dedicate parking for commercial or restaurant or office or uh, the other uses that are listed only for residential or lodging establishments. <clears throat> but we have a lot of these uses not in the downtown. Right. So this only applies to downtown. Um, so this section only applies to the downtown commercial business district. Just the, trying to get my, yep. my head wrapped around what area of town we're talking about. Nope. Good question. Let me bring up a map here for you. So the regulations under Article 3 will only apply to this red area in the downtown core. Ah. 
So basically from Main Street east to Casavan and from East Allen down to the river. Article okay, three. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying that and showing yep. the areas. I'm just looking for the language in where in section, in the beginning of section three, that sort of designates it as only downtown. I see it 3.6 development in and around downtown when you ski. Regulations will apply to any new development or redevelopment in the downtown core district. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yep, good questions. Good questions. But yeah, the article three is only for the downtown um, and article four parking is for everything outside of the downtown. Gotcha. Okay, so none of that has changed as I mentioned. So yeah, so driveways. Um, all right, let me make sure I'm in the right spot here myself. Conversion or change of use, that's nothing new. Uh, parking requirements. So yeah, as I mentioned, there's a couple of small tweaks in here. Nothing new from our previous discussions. Um, we're capturing the change in Act 47 for one space per unit uh, and just some, some language changes or consistency. Uh, and then just a few small edits somewhere. Oh yeah, here's one with the outdoor covered that we talked about previously on the bicycle parking, but then none of the none of the substantive parts of this section have changed. Just a few minor word changes. And then the dimensions as we talked about previously, um, referring to public work standards rather than having specific dimensions. This is something that actually came up again in one of the current housing bills that may have just passed out of the one of the chambers or both chambers today, possibly, that I believe it, the last version I saw did have dimensional requirements for minimum dimensional requirements for parking. Um, so this kind of takes all of that out of our regulations and puts it into public works where it can be easily changed as necessary if statute changes, for example. So, um, but there's some fairly common standards for those dimensions. So anyway. Uh, all right, next up is Article 5. I don't believe there's anything new in the majority of these sections. Um, when I say the majority, I'm going to skip ahead to the Section 512, 514. The can, I, can I um, just on Section 5.4? Yep. Um, which we struck the garage. I know it's kind of seems kind of ridiculous. We struck the garage sale um, language altogether. And yep. I actually went and I looked up. Um, I just was looking what other communities do. And I found the one that South Burlington uses. And it says garage yard sales are permitted no more than eight times per year. Each separate day counts as a separate sale um, for any given property. You do not need a permit. We do ask that you refrain from posting signage, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess, you know, we've talked about that a little bit before. And I just sort of feel like, you know, I, I grew up next to somebody who had one of these permanent garage sales in their house all the time. And it was sort of strange. So I don't know. It seems like there is language usually about garage and yard sales in most communities. And I think maybe we should keep it in there or a version of it. Well, so Sarah, the language you just quoted, if I heard you correctly, says that it does not yeah. need a permit. Yes, right. So there's really no way to police that or enforce it. Even though it says you can do it eight times a year, if there's no permitting requirement, then there's nobody that's really going out to check on any of of the number of times. So it kind of is a regulation without a regulation. Well, the only, I mean, why do communities do it then? I honestly, I have no idea. And I, I don't see, I, I don't know because the situation that you described where it's kind of a permanent yard sale, that would be a situation where we would treat that as a, as a business, not as a, as a yard sale. If it's something that's per, more permanent and is constantly happening, then we would treat that as a as a, a non non residential use, and and then we could we could issue a, a violation or 
in, uh, take enforcement action against it because it's a commercial use, not a residential use. Okay. Okay. That uh, that that covers it then. So there's 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 other yeah. mechanisms to get to get to it. your concern rather than somebody who just wants to sell some stuff on a Saturday. Does, yeah, I'm not that... worried about the Saturday sale. It's the <laughs> it's people that put up a permanent. Right. Does that like administratively kind of dovetail into like somebody who's basically like an unregistered or unlicensed car dealer? Because I they they follow kind of a similar pattern. There are people who like have a car for sale in front of their house, and it's like oh they're just selling their car. But then you're like oh you've had ten different cars for sale this year. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, we and, would look at it the same way. That if it's something that's pretty much like an on on an ongoing basis, we would. We we could we have other mechanisms to enforce that rather than than through some sort of garage sale provision. Okay. So if it became a problem, the city could do something about it. If it was, That's correct. If it was problematic. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Okay. So um, under section five point one four, this is our incentives for priority housing. Um, there are some changes here. Some of it's required by statute, some because statute changed and changed our regulations or made our incentives no longer incentives. So probably the main things that have changed um, is under the incentives. So planning unit developments, we previously had the residential A and B allowing four units per building and residential C allowing six units per building. So now we're changing it to any of the residential districts can do up to six units per building, provided that in this case, um, at least 50% of the dwellings in the overall project or proposal meet the qualifications of the, uh, the bedroom count. So they, the, at least half of the units need to have three bedrooms or more to qualify to, to do the six units per building. Um, in addition, we're granting 15% additional lot coverage to accommodate any additional size that might be needed to, to add those, those extra bedrooms. Um, the density bonus has not changed, except that we are allowing some additional lot coverage as well, because the density bonus comes from planned unit development where all of the units are affordable and have three or more bedrooms. So this will allow this will create an incentive to actually go down that road. I think previously limiting the lot coverage to, to, the, to the base lot coverage at 50% may not actually provide an incentive to anybody to do an entire project of three bedroom and affordable. So um, that's the only change here is to add the additional lot coverage. But I believe that was something we've talked about previously as well. Um, and then... Minimum parking is still the same. So the bonus- Let me interrupt you, Eric. Yep. For me, because I'm just gonna, again, I still I still have a, um, I don't say a concern. I guess I still feel like the RC zone should allow, um, be differentiated a little bit more because it is a higher density zone than the other districts. Um, and when you put the incentives in, we're, we're kind of recognizing that because you can get an extra unit uh, per, what is it, extra dwelling unit per lot in the RC zone versus half a unit in the RA. So either, I think those should either be the same or we change the, the, the uh, number of units allowed per building in the RC um, a little bigger. But again, we can have that discussion at the public hearing I just throw that out there for people to chew on. Well, I, that's a good point, Mike. Um, we could we could basically coalesce all uh, item I, double I, and triple I into one, so that it's just one additional number or percent of of unit that's uh, being permitted. Um, but yes, okay. that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I think there's nuance to leaving these gradations throughout the document because I don't think the number of units is the only indicator of density. I mean, just the way our zoning has been set up historically has created 
least dense to most dense through the districts. And that's done through a variety of things, including lot coverage and setback and number of units. And so right, which, it's worth which, discussing, but it, I don't think it's like, um, I don't think forcing additional units into RC is going to, is required to keep it and for it to continue to be the densest. They also have the smallest lot sizes that we're putting the units on. So, well, it, it, to your point, it's, I don't think it's going to be a big deal for most lots in town. And, and if you limit it, you know, so what, if, you, if someone can put six units on, on a property uh, in one building, you know, for a developer, it's cheaper to build. Um, yeah, I mean, it uh, It also goes back to this whole idea where like our incentives have to be actual incentives. And if you keep upping the baseline, there's nothing to incentivize off of. And we're trying sure, to sure. get at we these can, things can, that the market isn't naturally doing, which is these larger units, these more home ownership opportunities. And the more units you allow on a property, the more incentive you are to have an outside investor come in and put tiny units on it to fit as much as possible to make the most revenue off the property. So there's like implications of just, it's not as easy as saying, like, let's just load up the units for RC. And I think the neighbors, there's implications. We've heard from a, a couple of neighbors, I think three or four neighbors that wrote in about their concerns with that too. So I just want to make sure we're thinking like long-term about what that means and how they interact with these incentive and priority housing. Uh, under, understood. But again, my point is, we have to allow four units in the RA and RB, and if the RC is a is a it's really a higher density district, then allow someone to put more units in a building. And I understand that that you know that doesn't necessarily increase the density, but it allows for a bigger building. And there are restrictions on height and all that stuff anyway. So the, the dimensional requirements are going to dictate if you can put that many units in a building. And maybe the number is just five. I don't know. Uh, but just some differentiation. And then the incentive, you bump up by two units like you do in the RB and RC. But let's, we can discuss it at the public hearing. I, I'm probably the only one touting this, and that's fine. If the rest of the commission doesn't want to do it, that's... That's the right of the commission, and that's what I go with. Okay. So a new section that was discussed at the last meeting is uh, the bonus story. This is uh, based on statute. This is what we have to require per statute. So uh, we pulled, we had a bonus story provision in our gateway district, which is now referenced to this section. And I've got language in the in the document that talks about that as well. So again, this is all straight from statute, the bonus story part under part three here. So not really much we can do with that. Uh, and then there's a new section here, this administrative review. So this is something that is, we reviewed at the last meeting, but uh, again, since some of you were not at that meeting, basically what this is saying is that if half of the units in a project, because we have site plan review for anything over two units right now. Um, this is a provision that will allow, allow, you, allow a project to not have to go through site plan review if at least half of the units in the project were affordable and met the bedroom count and were offered for sale. It's the for sale piece that's kind of the, the differentiation here. So these projects can still have conditions imposed um, if it's a planned unit development or if they need any type of relief, if, if they're proposing a conditional use as part of it or any waivers for the setbacks, that still has to go to the development review board. Um, but if they're able to bring something forward that's strictly a four unit, four or fewer units, um, sorry. Yeah, it would be four or fewer units that half of them are affordable have at least three or more bedrooms and are offered for sale, then it can go through an administrative review process. And I think. So Eric, just to, we're, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see in this where it says four units or less. Well, so because, because we're talking about the, um, 
Oh, and maybe that's what I'm missing here. This is intended for the residential districts. Yeah. So in the residential districts, we only allow four units unless it's by a planned unit development. Right. So the planned unit development is captured under um, uh, under item B. Sorry, uh, under item C. So if you're proposing it as a planned unit development, then you would you would be doing more than four units if you're doing a planned unit development. So it's yeah. it's not explicit. So I I can add some language to make that explicit. Okay. Yeah, because. I'm trying to see going back and trying to see. I, I think in the heading it, you should have in the residential zones, so it's clear too. Yep. But so this would be a potential incentive for, um, yeah, to offer some ownership as well to to yep. kind of get out of that site plan review process and just do an administrative review for those smaller projects. That makes sense. And, and um, sorry, you were saying that smaller projects, meaning, um, sorry, what was the definition of your of a smaller project? Well, in this case, it would be four or fewer units. Four or fewer units could be eligible for administrative review as long as they have 50% of the project that it meets affordability, bedroom count, and sale. Correct. That's fifty percent of that. Yep. Yep. And then um, I have a question about the lot coverage. Um, we've added lot coverage to the each of the um, incentives that we currently have in place. Yep. And I'm wondering why we're adding them. Why we're adding an additional. Like why lot coverage is being added now? So the I think the addition of the lot coverage is going to make it easier to take advantage of those incentives. And actually, I was I was just going to ask if you all want to include a lot coverage a, a bonus under the administrative review section as well. Um, but you know, looking at what the requirements are to meet the looking at what, what you have to do to get the incentive, for example, doing um, uh, projects with three or more bedrooms to do a six unit building configuration, you're gonna have larger buildings that way. And if we're restricting it still to the, to the base lot coverage, it's gonna make it harder to put enough units on it to make the project work, I think. So and having that- that, that, you, that you've gotten based on how it are, it's written in, in in our current standard. Sorry, say that again. Is that um have you gotten feedback since this is already like codified in our um in our land use regulations? Have you gotten feedback that this is hard to do because of the lot coverage requirements? I'm just trying I, to sort of yeah, understand. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I actually have had conversations with um I have had conversations with several folks that were looking at doing just a standard four unit building and they could not make it work on the properties they were that they were trying to put them on because of the lot coverage limitation. So my thought was if we're going to allow for some additional lot coverage, then we should get something in return, which is what the incentives are for. So that because the one project I was I had some discussions on, mm -hmm. um, there was they were they were looking at potentially configuring an, or trying to get property from another lot to add to to the lot to so that they could meet the lot coverage requirement. So so we're not getting into so in order to avoid a situation where we have larger properties being slivered off to be added to smaller properties to to get to that uh, size that would allow the lot coverage the project to be under the lot coverage maximum offering the incentive to get something in return seemed like a good a good exchange to me. Okay. So in this case we would be 65% lot coverage if they do the 50% and then we would be at um 75% lot coverage up to 75% lot coverage if they were 100% of the right. bedroom and then yep. you're proposing in the administrative review 
I guess it's not in here, but you were saying it's not in here yet, but I was, yeah, I wanted to see if that was something you all would be interested in considering potentially a, a 15% bump as well to go to 65% or 75%. Yeah. I guess this brings me back to like the need to really, um, hone in on a definition for what lot coverage is and what's not lot coverage to have a better, if we're letting them cover 75% of a, of a, of a plan unit development yeah. um, with impervious and buildings, I mean, that's significant. So um, it only leaves 25% quote unquote open space or, or non-covered space. I would want to really, I want to, would want to make sure that sounds okay to everybody first. Like, is that feel right? And then um, make sure we have a definition for that open space so that it's meaningful open space and not sidewalks and staircases and medians and parking lots. So we we do have a definition of lot coverage currently. Um, just yeah, in our in our in Article Nine, we do have a definition for lot coverage that we have added or amended several years ago. We did amend it. Um, so it basically says that anything that is impervious is considered lot coverage. Except for side like sidewalks leading to doorways weren't aren't considered. Um sta outdoor staircases aren't considered yeah. towards lot coverage. Medians in parking lots aren't considered towards lot coverage. So there's a way I, I to use up are. your your little bit of lot coverage or lots that you aren't yeah. supposed to be covered. There's ways to essentially have. So so, Abby, yeah. I'm looking at the definition right now, and it says this this portion includes, but is not limited to, all areas covered by buildings, park uh, park structures, driveways, roads, sidewalks, and any area of pavement. So, sidewalks are considered part of the lot coverage. Yeah, I mean, Eric can speak to that, but has um, has told us that if it's just a walkway into a building, it's not considered, hasn't been considered in projects that have been looked at recently as part of lot coverage. And the same is true for like exterior staircases. And again, medians, I'm using these examples because they've come up in recent developments and haven't count, counted towards lot coverage. So I think it's worth relooking at that definition and then maybe even adding it to this article, this definitions article that we have in this document. So it's easy, easily referenceable. Mm -hmm. So we do we have definitions of what the open space on a lot like this would be like if we're covering 75 does would it be helpful to do it that way as well? Yeah, that's that's sort of what I was getting at. Like let's yeah. have really yeah. clear definitions about what that 25% yeah. can be and right. not be. Then maybe what we should think about is instead of having a maximum on lot coverage, we have a requirement for open space on properties. So that we say a per, a X percentage has to remain open. And then by default, the rest of it can be lot coverage. So that we're so that we're capturing a we're we're designating a specific percentage that has to remain open and free of any type of encumbrance. Yeah. At all. I mean, it's isn't it yeah. kind of it's one or the other. It's the same thing. It's just backwards right it's either lot coverage so the rest is open space or open space so the rest is lot coverage i don't know is it hard, if it hurts to put a definition of open space in there that you know so i think the the difference mike agreed but there's a there's a subtle difference where we have some things that are exempt from zoning so for example an ada ramp to to somebody's house yeah we don't require a zoning permit that's allowed wherever you need it to be. Um, as Abby mentioned, stairs to a to an entrance, provided it's not, um, yeah, stairs to an entrance or onto a deck. We we generally do not consider. Uh, we don't require permits for that because it's it's a means of egress or or ingress and or access. Period. So we don't we don't take those types of components into account when we're looking at lot coverage because they don't require zoning. So we're not reviewing them in that regard. So if we flip it to a percentage that a minimum percentage that needs to remain open, then we're basically saying you have to have so much open space on the property and then the rest of it can be whatever you want it to be. 
so that it's kind of locking in that open space component. Yeah, yeah. I like that better. Yeah, so, and that sort of gets at the the idea behind the PUD, right? It's like, we're going to let you densify a certain area of your property because you're gaining that sort of open space in other areas of the property. So don't yeah. you still have the same thing though, Eric, if, if you if you define open space and say, you know, let's just say a, a minimum of 25% of the lot has to be open space and you define it, but if someone has to put in a stairs to a front porch, they can be in the open space. A handicap ramp can be in the open space. And I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here, right? Yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's true. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. All right. Let me, let me look at that. Maybe there's a different yeah. way to, to kind of approach this that, yeah. that we can in, in the context of these incentives and these, the priority housing, we can have some level of requirement of a certain amount of area that remains completely open and, Lot of yeah. area. I mean, I think right. we all we all kind of know what we're what we're saying, what we're shooting for. We just are having trouble defining how do we put that into words, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we want some air around some of these areas. We don't want it all right. piecemealed together and have twenty five percent open space, but they're all two foot squares, right. Not, right. not adjacent. You know. Or yeah, well, that's a whatever. that's a good point. That's why I think we need a definition of open space. What is it? You know, yeah, and yeah. and it can include, you know, a contiguous, right? You know, right. Something, yep. something to that effect. Yeah, or or two different plots that are contiguous. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be one plot, but it needs right. to be with some size to it. I think is, yeah, kind of what we're feeling. Yep, I can uh, I can look at that and and see what see what options might be available. Great. So, um, so yeah, so that's what we have for administrative review. Um, and that pretty much brings us to the end of this section. Uh, the next section is definitions. Nothing's new here from previous discussions. The only, I, I will say the only thing that I, I believe I added it after, yeah, it's not included in here. Um, oh, I went past it. Um, adding so affordable housing development, we had a discussion about this several meetings ago about kind of what this means. I was going to add that this is a statutory definition that Act 47 is basically saying we have to um, accommodate um, the. So this goes back to the bonus story as as part of Act 47 and what they're requiring. So I was gonna I was just gonna add the statutory reference to this definition so that folks know where this is coming from. Do we do we have a de we don't have a definition for short term rental? Is that something that other communities are putting in? And we actually useful? we do, Sarah. We do. It's not included okay. in zoning. It's in the municipal code. Under, okay, so it doesn't it's need under to the be, housing section. It doesn't need to be in zoning then. Uh, no, because we don't treat it as a as a use. We don't treat a short term rental as a use. We treat it as a as a dwelling, and then how it's managed or regulated is done through our municipal code. Okay. With our other rental properties and similar uh, similar components, so we do have standards for short term rentals. It's done through our our I believe it's Chapter fifteen of the Municipal Code, Chapter fifteen or seventeen. Uh, I've brought this up before, both. but but would it be useful to make short term rental a use? Just not necessarily for discussion tonight, but like to look into that a little bit more. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Eric, can I have a biggie on affordable housing definition? I think you're missing an S after it says 15 years, 15 years. Oh yeah. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> happy to happy to make that big correction. Yes, thank you. Eric, um, <clears throat> would you mind going back up to the bonus story um, sure. section? Sure. Um, so you said this language is required as a part of Act 47? Yes, because in bonus story, they refer to an affordable housing development as, as defined in statute. So that's why we're adding the definition of affordable housing development. So, but statute has these, like, if you do a bonus story, you get the maximum density. That's correct. Okay. Yep. So we so if they have affordable housing, 
they can exceed the maximum density up to 40%. So we're that's like looking at right there almost, that's like 75%. So, so keep in mind, they can exceed the way this is, this is going to be a little tricky to enforce and to really to address in Winooski. Um, the way this is written, a, an affordable housing development, if we look at the definition, let me just skip back down to that. I think it's really important to, to look at the definition of affordable housing development because at least 20% of the units or a minimum of five, whichever is greater, have to be affordable units. Mm -hmm. So that is, unless it's done as a planned unit development, that's only going to happen. That's not going to happen in any of our residential districts because that would put your, your uh, total project at like 25 units. Um. Housing development, at least 20% of the units are a minimum of five. So it could be smaller than 25 units. It wouldn't, it wouldn't meet the definite. Well, they could do an entire project that's an affordable housing development, um, but. They could do like a 10 unit development and then have, yeah, like 50% of the units be affordable housing and meet our the definition and be able to get that bonus. I suppose they could, yes. But keep in mind also the bonus only applies to um density and building height. It does not oops, wrong. It does not increase lot coverage. Okay, so projects may exceed the maximum density permitted in the zoning district. So what is that re related to? Density. Well, how are they using that? That's a great question because uh the legislature just not everybody uses density as a, as a measure. So uh, in most of our districts, actually, we don't use density as, as a measure of anything. So I think only our, our uh, central business district, I think that's the only one that has a density standard in it of 60 units per acre. Um, so I honestly, I really don't know. I think it's going to depend on, on the project itself and what they're proposing. And if they're, so for example, if they're proposing 10 units and they're going to make half of them affordable, mm -hmm. um, then 40% of that would give them four more units and an additional story. So I think we'd have to look at it on a project by project basis to see what they're proposing to give them the density bonus. But then that also means they, they have to meet all the rest of our standards as well. So they'd have to meet lot coverage. They'd have to meet setbacks. They'd have to meet parking. Um, they'd have to meet all the other requirements that we have in place. It doesn't just automatically grant them relief from our standards because they're doing affordable units. So um, density, your interpretation of density is units, not lot coverage. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And in, in this in this context, that is what they're referring to is units, not lot coverage, because um, they're they're basically creating an incentive to build affordable housing. And then because of the affordable units, they can add more units with that bonus story. So in theory, someone who is building four affordable um, units in one of our residential districts can build 40% more than that four because they're doing 100% affordable. So they could build like six units. Well, it depends on how big their project is. If they're only doing four total units, then no, because they wouldn't meet the definition of affordable housing development. Okay. Because it's a five unit minimum. Because it's okay. five unit minimum. Just trying to play out like how this interacts with with our regs and these other incentives we have in there. My other question is, um, how does the um, how does this interface with what the housing commission is working on in terms of an overlay zoning district for affordable housing? Is that is that does that give us coverage to get? you know, that that overlay district will give us a certain percentage of affordable housing mandated. And then our incentives are really focused on three plus in home ownership. I think that's going to be the intent. Yes. Is that we're, we're looking at a, a requirement for inclusionary housing that would apply to um, projects that meet a certain threshold, I think. Uh, and then they would be required to put in a certain number of units. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about this. The next item, we're going to look at some of that language and just kind of the 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 
the mechanisms for affordable or for the inclusionary housing and the uh, the replacement housing regulations. So, um, but yes, the the intent of those regulations would be that that would be a requirement on projects over a certain size, regardless of what you're building. Even mm -hmm. if you're doing all single and studios, you would have still mm -hmm. have a requirement of affordability. Yeah, and so if the overlay district really will get at the affordability piece, should ours be focused on the bedroom count and the ownership pieces? I, I think so, because, well, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, you mean taking the affordability piece out of our incentives? Instead of adding this like sort of third incentive area because we don't really have any owner, home ownership incentive built into our existing incentives, incorporating home ownership into our density bonus or our multi-unit building, probably the density bonus. I see. So that we're not like requiring them to build um, affordable, which I think is much stronger than us incentivizing it. So we're requiring it that them to do it, but then giving them like freebies for doing what they're required to is sort of what, where I'm, yeah. what I'm trying to get at. Well, so I, I will say that part of statute, if we do, if we do add inclusionary zoning requirements, we do have to offer incentives for those units or for that, those projects. Statute does require that there is some level of incentive being offered. So we will have to offer some component of an incentive to projects that do inclusionary zoning. And will that be built into the inclusionary zoning? Like, will the inclusionary zoning language end up with us and the planning commission and our yes. regulations? It will. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. So I guess if it's going to be eventually incorporated into our work, then when it's created and incorporated, this could potentially change based on what those regulations, what that ends up looking like. Potentially. I think the difference is what we have here in um, section 5.14 is really related to the the priority housing. So the affordability and the bedroom count. So mm -hmm. we still are, we may just, I guess we potentially could strip out some of the affordability components because it would be covered under the inclusionary, but keep the bedroom count uh, pieces in. Yeah, and add the own the home ownership piece in right. Yes, the, the, dens the density bonus, for example, which has both affordability and three plus bedroom. Correct. So, does it make sense to do that now, um, or does it make sense to do that as we learn more about the the overlay? I would say we should not strip out the affordability now because I don't know when we're going to be. I don't know what our well. We can talk about this a little bit later as well uh, with our next joint meeting with the Housing Commission, but I, I don't want us to lose the affordability pieces now because we can always take those out later. Um, okay. The inclusionary will be part of the zoning, so we will be making amendments at that time. And actually, I have them drafted as um, sections 516 and 517, so they'd be in this article as well. So we can make sure everything is um, internally consistent at that time. Great. Thank you. Eric, the, yes. the, the affordable housing development definition you said is right from statute? Correct. That makes sense because it is somewhat confusing because when I first read it, and I think this is how you were interpreting it, it's 20% of the units up to a minimum of five. You know what I'm saying? So in other words, 20% of the units um, a minimum of five meant that you had to have 25 units to reach that five threshold. Yes. But the way Abby was talking about it, I understand that interpretation too. So it's it's something that could be interpreted two different ways. And so I, I guess we can't change it because it's what statute says. But when I first read it, the 20% was the overriding number. The five was just you had to have enough units in a project to reach that threshold of five. You know what I'm saying? Well, so yeah, but yes, I do. But the way that the way that I interpret it and the way that uh, my colleagues interpret it is that basically your project needs to have at least 25 units. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's how I interpret it initially. Right. And, but what Abby was saying, I can understand that interpretation as well. 
Yeah, because yep. it would meet both the at least 20% and the minimum of five units. If you did anything five or more, if you have five units and they're all affordable, it meets the definition. If you have um, right. 10 right. units and 50% are affordable, it meets the definition. Yeah, I, and I would interpret it that way as well. So the because in that case, you've got five units and 100% of 100%, the project. Yeah. So, so, it, so it doesn't just deal with buildings 25 units or larger. No, correct. But to, for the minimum of the 20% or five, it needs to be at least 25 units. If you're just going to do the minimum, going for the it, minimum. Needs to be, it needs to be tw it needs to be 25 units. Yeah. So yes, if you're doing more than the minimum, then yeah, then we're looking at different numbers and, and different, gotcha. different projects work, but then we're getting more affordable units. So it's, I think it's, it's a win for the community. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> time will tell. Right. Um, okay. All good questions, all good discussion. So no other real changes in any of the rest of this. I don't believe from our last several meetings. Um, so I'm going to skip through all this stuff. Unless anybody has any questions, please stop me. Uh, okay, so here we are into the form-based code. We looked at this, I believe this the first time we looked at it was at our last meeting. So in the Gateway Zoning District, we had a provision for bonus stories, or we still have a provision for bonus stories. One of those options was housing affordability. Proposing to delete all this language and just reference the, the languages looked at because that's, that's the one that's going to carry the day. So we still have other options for a bonus story in our Gateway that would only apply to the gateway for sound mitigation and uh, green building standards. So those will remain, the affordability piece will just be referenced to uh, section 514. Uh, okay, moving on in the detached frontage building form standard, we have a couple of changes we need to make based on statute. Um, this is one actually more just on, on lot size, just to, Kind of better again because we're allowing for more units at, um, in this district. Wanted to add some updated language to kind of amend uh, or to capture that the the projects for um, three and four unit rather than just the the two unit. Um, and then under the use section, referencing back to section two point four, there was some discrepancies between what we had in our land use table in section 2.4 and what we were saying in this section. So just to clarify, everything's gonna reference back to section 2.4 on the land use table and then uh, accessory structures with the reference, or sorry, accessory dwellings with the reference to section 5.1. And then some amendments that we talked about at the last meeting, which are, are not related to the to Act 47, but are, are more cleanup that we've been I've been tracking and want to figure since we're in this section, it would be a good time to bring these forward. Um, the first changes, these are just clarification in this section, just some reorganization of the language. Under the roofs and parapets section, the primary change is related to, um, yes, under C, attic stories. So currently, the regulations exempt attic stories from the overall building height and story count in the gateway zoning district. So I'll, I'll take a step back. In the gateway, we measure we measure height by by either well, I should say by both number of stories and a maximum overall height. So you can't exceed either of those. Attic stories are not included in the building height or the number of stories. So there's been several projects that have either been proposed or um, kind of generally designed that include a mansard roof on the as the as the attic story, which given the pitch of that roof, or sorry, I guess I'd say the, the dimensions or the angles of the walls, it in essence functions as an additional story. So this item C is basically to say, if you have a pitch that exceeds a 12-12 or a 45% slope, so kind of getting at that mansard style roof, that's counted as another story. You're not, you're not going to be able to put those in and in essence get the benefit of the additional dwellings and living space 
but not have that count towards your your overall height. So this is really just to kind of capture that loophole and and bring it into bring this piece into conformance with the with the code. Um, the next section is on signage. Again, some just some clarification and reorganization. So Eric, I'm sorry, going back yeah. to the attic. But if I have a if I have a um, a roof that's twelve twelve or or shallower, um, I can use that space as living space if it if I've got the height. Yes, you know if you if you have the height, you could. Yeah, yeah. You but know, we were we like would require. Cave. Yeah, um, I mean, you're not going to get as much living space in there, and it's going to be pretty right. limited because you're going to need to have seven foot tall ceilings at a minimum. Yeah, and so you're not going to get that out at the out at the pitches. So you'll have kind of a narrow living space in the middle, and then you'll have to have you'll have issues with egress and daylighting, things like that. So right. um, those spaces are going to be it would be hard to use them, but I guess somebody probably could figure out a way to do it. You, I'm just, it just thinking of the you know the old Cape style homes that don't have dormers on them. They they put a bedroom or two up there. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. This is really, this is going to prevent an, a whole additional story right. of dwellings. Gotcha. Okay. So, okay. Under signage, the main change here is just related to sign lighting. Um, we didn't really have anything on lighting. So basically saying that it's got to be downcast and shielded and, only on the, the 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 sign itself. This is again, this is lighting related just to signs. So some new language here um, for signage. And then the next section on mechanical equipment, organizational again. The main change here is related to some new language under mechanical equipment, basically to say that any type of exhaust or air intake or venting has to be, cannot be located on the street space side, regardless of how high above the ground it is. There's been a couple of examples where um, we've had, we've had to have some, some changes have been required to some designs because they had mechanical equipment on the front of the building high up on the, on the floors. Um, so that's four item five was added for actually the 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 instance for this was actually four quarters um, because they have their grain silo next to the building. Technically, that's mechanical equipment, but because of the size of it, there's no way for them to screen that adequately. So really, this was designed. This section was added to say, OK, we understand that some uses may have equipment that's going to be just so unruly, you can't do anything about it. So it's really intended to try to screen it or have it blend in with the building or have it set as far away from some of the street spaces as possible so it's not intrusive. I think given the use and the nature of, of what they're doing with their grain silo, it it works. Um, I think they still have some plans to potentially paint it as well or paint some murals on it to have it kind of blend in also a little bit better. But that's really what item five is intended for, is that if you have equipment that is just so unruly but is a necessary part of your operation, we we have to take that into account. I don't know. They could have grown hops around it. Well, yeah. and they actually, I think they are, or they were growing hops across the, on the deck there as well. So they might, yeah, yeah. they can definitely do that. It does remind me of for decades, the, the old coffee cup bakery had a huge flower. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And, and then even before that, like uh, in Burlington, we used to have the peas grain tower on the waterfront. And then there were people fighting to save it when they wanted to tear it down. Right. Yep. So, and then item six here is intended to basically say what? that, oh, and sorry, one, go ahead. Yep, so go ahead. would you add anything in the, in five about that it incorporates nicely with the architectural style of the building or something? I mean, could it be, because that's sort of what the grain silo looks like. It, it's all sort of modern. It looks, it looks fine, really. Um, I guess, I would hesitate to do that because I don't know what the equipment's going to be. So if, yeah, if right. yeah, I would hate for them to have to alter the equipment to match a building and it, and it, and it kind of debate, uh, um, negates the, the use of the equipment or the need for the equipment, then I, I, I wouldn't want to limit them to, to, I would want to make it as open as possible for how they, how they treat the equipment to, 
to make it blend in better. And and let's be to keep in mind that is the only example of all the buildings that have been constructed or modifications to any projects in the gateway where this has ever come up. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this is going to be for very specific uses and circumstances where this is even going to apply. The, um, okay. the those like I think in like hospitals those huge air systems that they have to um, incorporate are of kind of similar proportions, but usually they do end up sticking them towards, you know, back of house. Um, right. Yep. Yep. So, and then item six here is really just to capture the fact that we want to make sure that uh, the fire department has their equipment, the fire department connection in the, in the most convenient place for them because it's a life safety issue. And so if they want something on the front of the building, then they should be allowed to have it there because it's either going to be they they will place their equipment or yeah they'll place their equipment in in proximity to fire hydrants in proximity to um ease of use uh in proximity to basically to not block streets if they can help it so i want to make sure that the these life safety devices are in the location where the fire department wants them to be so that's what item six is here to, to capture so that it, it is a piece of mechanical equipment and sometimes it may end up in the street space. And that's okay in this case because it's really just basically a valve cover that you'll see on the front of the building. Uh, and maybe a, a strobe light to indicate that that's where the fire is if somebody pulls the alarm. So also we want the fire department to be able to see what what the where the building is. And so if they need to put a strobe or something on the outside of the front of the building, that's okay too. Um, and they they do that anyway because under item A they are technically the agency having jurisdiction. And I did look that up. It is a it is a state term, or it it's a defined term, but it depends on the situation. So, for example, in this instance, the fire department is the agency having jurisdiction. Um, the EPA could be the agency have, having jurisdiction with environmental issues. Um, you know, it, it it it's really more of a catch all to say this is the group that is in charge of this thing. So. Um, and Eric, is um, their definition of clear sidewalk? I see it's all in caps, but I'm- Yes. What does yep. that mean exactly? And where does that definition live? That is in the gateway district in appendix B. Uh, so yeah, any of the words that appear in the all caps are, are definitions and they're all included in appendix B. Uh, in the definitions for the gateway district. So the, the clear sidewalk is basically the sidewalk space, or sorry, the, the yeah, the portion of the sidewalk within the street space that needs to be uh, clear. So pretty much your whole sidewalk area is gonna be your clear sidewalk. Okay, thanks. And so that brings us to the end of this. Oh, um, yeah, I also am striking this affordable housing provision. I don't know if we looked at this the last time, but there's language in the gateway about affordable housing, and but it specifically references back to the bonus story. And since we're pulling the bonus story out of this section um, and there's standards for what that bonus story is based on statute, this I think there's just too many conflicts with this section or too much redundancy. So I'm proposing to strike this and it what what we have under bonus story from statute will carry uh, the requirements for that uh, provision. Since this was specific to the bonus story that we're striking anyway from from the gateway district. So that is a, a walkthrough of the um changes that are going to be going to public hearing uh, at our next meeting. Um, so any questions on any of that stuff? And like I said, at that hearing, we can propose changes, um, have more hearings, do whatever you, you need to do at that point. But that is at least our first opportunity to take public comments, formal public comments on the amendments that are being proposed. I was going to do a time check and it just came up 754. So do we want to get into the um, section 516 and 517? 
So the only th the, the reason I included these in the agenda is not so that we would actually review the language because I still I still want the discussions with the Housing Commission to inform some of what actually ends up here. Really, the intent of me including the this uh, these sections in the agenda was really more to familiarize you with what the inclusionary housing requirements are and the replacement housing uh, requirements are. That, that's not to say that this is all that will be in there and that this is what the, the final version will look like. It was more just to, to get you familiar with, with kind of the regulatory structure and, and what these regulations are generally intended to do, kind of what their purpose is, how they function, not as much the details of the numbers and the, the, the specifics, but more just kind of the, the overall framework. So um, I was not intending to walk through these documents and make edits at this time, I, like I said, I think I want to. I would prefer to wait until we have the discussion with the Housing Commission, and can have that feedback and dialogue with them at our next. Um, sorry, at, yeah, at our next joint meeting in June. So, this is again, like I said, just more to familiarize you with these with these concepts and what this looks like. Okay. Do, do, do. So I need to hop off. Uh, thank you very much for coming, Ruth. Thanks, Ruth. Okay, so so I'm okay with with postponing or holding off on discussing these in any detail. Okay, so we'll move on to city updates then. Time for the mayor to come back, show her face to us. Ah, oh, she is there. You are there. I'm here. I'm here. Wake up. <laughs> um, not much to update. The only. Trying to think of any commission updates I've heard from other counselors. The only significant council action, um, we approved using reserves to do a $500,000 down payment on the new fire truck to reduce the debt service and tax impact that's scheduled for delivery next year. Keeps getting pushed back. We had the presentation from the CCRPC on the LaFountain Dion scoping study and council gave direction to have them come back to us with an updated design. So the long-term recommendation included narrowing the streets, making many roundabouts at the intersections to slow traffic and removing all parking along the corridor and putting tree belts on both sides. Council asked to modify that to retain the tree belt on one side and parking on the other as these edits that we have been discussing and things that we see coming down the line, we think there's going to be increasing density in the area that would impact the parking usage and also want to retain the flexible space of on-street parking in case needs change in the future where that space would be easier to convert to like protected bike path or bus parking um, versus the expense of needing to modify the street in the future if you had to rip out an entire tree belt to add more, more function in. So they're going to riff on what that could look like and come back to us probably at least two meetings from now. And then there'll be another opportunity for public engagement and for council to either adopt the plan or not. Um, the scoping study is aligned to the fact that Lafayette Street is priority for water main replacement, but we don't actually have that like scheduled in the near term. So we were talking about it as like a 10 to 15 years out sort of thing. Christine, does the sewer, the sewer lines have to be replaced too, or were those, um, redone? I know we did a lot of slip, what do they call it? Slip, uh, slip lining, slip lining. I don't know that for sure. I know the priority was on the water line. Uh, the sewer lines weren't mentioned, but I'm not sure if they're like included. Okay. Oh, and we are potentially having our annual like strategic prioritization June 9th or 10th, still up in the air on which date. Um, hopefully coming out of that, we'll have some thoughts on commission work for the upcoming year. However, I'm I'm not sure that matters here because I think this group and our, we do our own thing. Are really busy for some months. Yeah. 
Christine, yeah, what about um, did you hear? Did you do the public or the the hearing on the uh, changes at the O'Brien Center for the, the? Oh, that was the third thing I couldn't remember. <laughs> yeah, we did that on Monday and we adopted those changes, so we're good to go. So thank you all for that. Great. So over to you, Eric. Um, I don't have anything additional to add on city updates. Okay. Other businesses. Does anyone have any other business? So just as a reminder, our next meeting will be May 23rd. That'll be the uh, two weeks. That'll be a public hearing uh, that has been warned for the amendments that we just looked at. Um, being the second meeting of the month, that's typically the one that y'all said you wanted to be in person for as much as possible. So we will still have an online option for that meeting. Um, also, just as a reminder, we're uh, scheduling the next joint meeting with the Housing Commission for June 25th. That's a Tuesday. Um, I believe that's a 6 p.m. start. Um, and that will take place. That will replace our second June meeting. So uh, we would not have a meeting then on June 27th. Yes, June 27th. We would <clears throat> we would use our second June meeting for that joint meeting on the 25th. But more to come on that. Okay. <clears throat> And just for the record, I will not be able to attend the 23rd. So I will not be able to attend either. Okay, thank you. Okay. There are so if, you have, if you have any feedback you want us to consider during the hearing, probably shoot it over to Eric on any of the Oh, yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Eric, remind me when your last day is? Uh, June 20, 28th. Okay, so you'll take us through the end of June. Yep. Great. There's no other business, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. And before we do that, thank everyone for coming tonight for the discussion. Uh, Christine, thanks for being here. Eric, thanks for all your work. Thank you um, all. Sorry, one more question. How is the um, hiring process going for your replacement, Eric? Um, I, I, I don't know. I know the, the job has been announced, uh, or the, the position has been announced, but I have not been involved in those discussions. So I, I don't know how many applications have been received or what that process looks like moving forward. Okay. You don't even know if they've started interviewing. I do not know if they have, I don't think they have, I, the, I believe they're keeping the, keeping it open until the 16th. For some reason that rings a bell um, and then, May. yeah, May 16th and then start doing interviews after that. But I, I don't know for sure. So it doesn't okay. sound like we're going to have any crossover then. Yeah. Well, I think that's still the goal is to have have at least uh, a week or two of, of overlap. Maybe not with you all, but with myself and whoever the, the eventual um, candidate is. Okay. Okay. okay thanks. Looking for a motion to adjourn. I'll move. So move. Okay. And well, I'll, I heard Tommy first, so and second from Joe. Yep. All in favor. <laughs> Aye. Night, everyone. I heard anything from Tommy night. all night, so I figured I'd give.